tonight we're talking about running around in wetsuits. And telemedicine. Well, you, I think you mean telehealth, don't you, Junior? You're right there, yeah. yeah. yeah midlife crisis. Yeah, that's appropriate. Improv. <laughs> well, you mean making it up or do you go along? Yeah, just like we do on Veterinary Ramblings. And tonight it's with Pete the Vet. Or as we know him, Pete Wedderburn. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Here he is. Yeah. Let's get the man in. Bing bong. Hi and guys. Here's the man himself. Bing bong. It's me. In a second. Hi, how's it going? Hi, B. Hello. How are you? You alright? I'm very well, very well considering. What got you into all of this media thing in the first place, then, B? Because you you yeah. started writing. You, you do a regular column in the Telegraph, isn't it? Yeah. I um well for me it started really, I guess it goes back to back to the start of my career. Well, when I came to, see, I, I'm from Scotland originally, I come to Ireland, I buy into a practice, and it's a small practice, one vet practice, and you're kind of, you're not really busy enough, and so you're saying, well, how, what can we do to get a bit of interest? And mm. so I did I did two things. First of all, I started writing a column in the local newspaper. Right. Um, and I, I did that partly because I really enjoyed writing, and partly because I thought, well, there's a PR opportunity to build a practice. And then once you start doing anything in, in in the public domain, I suppose, your name gets known a little bit. So what happened then was there was there was a particular crisis in the UK that you guys remember well, when a baby was killed by a dangerous dog. And this is this was this is back about 1992, 93. Yeah. And that was when it was then that all the political pressure started for dangerous dog breed regis- legislation, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. when that stuff all went on, the local the local radio station called me and said, Look, we'd like you to come and talk to us about this issue because they knew my name from the local newspaper and that's when the first time i sort of sat in front of a microphone and i remember being really really spooked by sitting in front of the microphone i found it extremely intimidating and yep. frightening but then i found actually as well as being frightening like a lot of things in life as well as being frightening it was actually really quite exciting and, mm-hmm. and, and, and exhilarating like skiing or something i thought well this is this isn't so bad and you so the adrenaline buzz of fear yeah, exactly. And then that then led to um, me thinking, well, if I could do this more often, it would also be good to, as PR for the practice. So I started to do it every week. Uh, and I've, I've done the, lo- the local radio then every week for the past, I suppose, 25 years now. So then, you see, you've then developed a little bit of a speciality in working in the media with local newspapers, local radio. So then what happens is um, the national radio and national newspapers and, 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 and national TV come along and ask you if you do something. And the, the secret to all the media stuff that I've learned is you just never say no. You just and if you never say no, then then people are more likely to ask you. And what you also learn pretty early on is that I mean I think a lot of folk are, are nervous about the media because they think they're going to be made to look like idiots. You know, they, they, th- they think they're going to be tripped up. They think they're going to be fooled into saying something which can be manipulated into meaning something else. Do you know that kind of thing? Mm. But the truth is that nearly all journalists. All they want is to get their shit done. They just they want to just come up with a story, get it out there, finished. And yeah. the last thing that they want to do is to alienate their guests. No, you're absolutely right. Because it, yeah. it, serves, it serves nobody any purpose, does it? And no, then, not at all. And so, but, but basically, what what went what, what happened from there was I kind of I found for myself that, and I, we're all different on this. I found full time, full on veterinary practice kind of about 15 years ago. So I've been doing it 15 years full on. I began to find it was just, I, I, I guess I found it too stressful. I found it wasn't what, how I wanted to spend every minute of every day. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, to get a bit deeper than that, what actually happened was I began to feel physically unwell and I thought I had something wrong with me. And I went to my doctor and I sort of talked to him about this. And he said, he listened to me for a long time and said, how do you spend your time? I told him when I was going to the clinic, um, you know, half eight in the morning until half seven at night, that all seemed pretty normal to me. And then um, once I got b- um, back from work, then I would sit down and write my newspaper column two evenings a week. And that was it, really. He, he looked at me for a long time. He said, well, listen, I'll tell you what to do. I think you need to have a really good think about your lifestyle and about how sustainable it is. I think you need to adjust things. So mm-hmm. I want you to go away and adjust things. And then after six weeks, once you've done that, if you're still feeling unwell, unwell as you are, then come back to me and I'll put you onto antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Interesting. Yeah, so he was basically yeah. telling yeah. me that I was I, I I just didn't have the balance right. So I, I learned then, you see, that I didn't want full-time clinical practice. I wanted a balance of yeah. clinical practice and some media work to to just to mix it up, I guess. And I, I, I'm really highly motivated by getting the message out to the public of how things should be. You know, a lot of animal cruelty, a lot of animal welfare problems come pretty much directly from, you could cruelly call it ar- uh, ignorance. You could say it's ignorance, or I'd rather just say people just don't have the right information. They just don't know. They just don't know. And so they don't mean to be cruel to these animals. It, it's fact, mean- it, it, it often comes around, we've had this chat with with a lot of different right. guests. Yep. Yeah. And what it comes down to is that, that owners can't know what they don't know. And uh, how do they know to look something up if they don't know they need to look something up? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, uh, I think you're right. People, people generally are nice and caring. Yes. The majority of people who, who have a pet, who want a pet, want one because they want to lavish love and attention on it. And it's the not knowing the correct way of doing that. It is. Uh, and, and that's where engagement with the media comes in, because I know that I can reach an awful lot of people with the right message most easily by working in the media. And so it was when I then, see at that time, uh, 14, 15 years ago, when I decided to take time away from the practice, so I started to have a couple of days off a week, actually, I then had time to say, okay, well, I, I need to get some media work to build up the earnings so I don't need, to, so I can have this time off from the practice. Right. And that's yeah, that's when I, I wrote to every woman newspaper I could think of, including every newspaper in Ireland, UK, and even North America. And... I sent out a whole wave of letters and there, because it was letters in those days, it wasn't emails. Yep. And they got like zilch back. And then I sent them out again six months later and again got zilch back. And then a phone call came from the Telegraph out of the blue saying that their pet columnist had just retired and they were they, they had my letter on file from some time when I contacted them before that oh. one, of my, one of my away <laughs> letters. And that was it really. And like most jobs, once you come up with the goods every week, it just kind of keeps on happening, really. You know, we we met the we met at was it a U4 uh conference? Quite likely, two or three years ago, yeah. um, and you you told me there that you broke the telegraph. So, uh, so rather embarrassingly, I had to start getting the telegraph, and my wife then you know, I tell you, you're coming a Tory, are you? What are you doing this for? No. Well, no, no, a friend of mine writes for it. <laughs> and then she found no actually the, the used telegraph lines the tortoise enclosure quite well, so she was happy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we should we should stress at this point that uh, other national na- newspapers are available. Yeah. They are indeed, <laughs> <laughs> including in America. <laughs> so, so what 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 made you become a vet in the first place, then, Peter? Well, I'm one I'm one of those total vocational vets. Like when I was four years old, I wanted to own a pet shop, and then kind of around five years of age I I copped on to the fact that that would be pretty useless because it was just much more complicated than than I thought as an innocent four-year-old and I realized that (laughs) as a vet you could have more engagement with 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 animals more hands-on and it just I decided then and there at the age of five that's what I wanted to do and then I was I was of the age where when I was 11 or 12, which would be like mid 70s, I suppose, in the, in the mid 70s, that's when James Herriot's books were really peaking. They were big then, weren't they? They were big, and the, and the, the, the BBC original Creature and Small Series came out. So his, his nostalgic writing, and you know, his beautiful language and, and, and just very observational descriptions of, of his work. I think anybody who was half thinking about being a vet would be convinced by by reading his stuff that definitely that was the way you want to spend your life. Right. So that's that's really what happened to me. It actually made life very easy for me because it meant that I knew from a very early age that I had to do well at school. There was no half mm. measures. You know, if you it's so black and white. You either get the grades, you get straight A's, or you're out. And that was it. So and I discovered that I could get straight A's if I worked really hard. Um, <laughs> and um, it's I, a great motivate, motivate, right? I, I, sure is. I'm exactly the same as you, Pete. I decided at the age of five to, to become a vet. Mm. 
it's funny, isn't it? It's like in you. Mm, yeah. And 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 but the, the, the funny thing was though that then as you get older, you realize you have to find a bit better than that. Like being a vet isn't just it's not like a thing. Well, it is a thing, but it's like there's there's lots of different versions of being a vet. Yeah. 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 I, 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 yeah. So I, when I was a student, I thought that being a zoo vet it seemed pretty cool. I used to go along to Edinburgh Zoo every week, and I had to look after the penguins as my kind of volunteer thing. And that was quite. I enjoyed that. It was fun. But I, I think I learned at that age. I learned that zoo vet meant that of all the people that visit the animals in the zoo. The one who's hated the most is the vet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because he grabs them and sticks things into them. So uh, so I, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, if I'm into kind of being close to animals and and kind of all that stuff, it's not, I, I don't really want to be a zoo vet. So then I, um, when I qualified, I went to Africa for a year. Uh, wow. It's a kind of patronizing thing that they did at Edinburgh University. Looking back on it, it was patronizing. At the time, it was the thing. We went on an expedition an expedition to Africa. Um, these days... <laughs> they give you a little piss helmet. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, these days... The you brothers, have... the hunter. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> these days, you'd probably call it a research project. It's kind of, that's what it was. We were doing studying cattle ticks. And I, I thought, I quite liked the idea of, of being an itinerant vet traveling the world. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think a year in Africa kind of a bit like the time at the zoo kind of taught you the complexity of it and you realize well you know that does yeah. has big implications if you if you do have get married and have a family and stuff and you're sort of zipping around all over the world well do you really want that um so then i came back and i, I did james Herriot stuff for three years in the scottish borders um have you done mixed practice julian yeah yeah three years three years Three years after qualifying, yeah. So, okay, so I did that thing, and that thing is a is is a great learning experience, and I, you know I have many fantastic memories. You you learn how to do this, you know, with a yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And then I you, you, that you know you know not to tuck your um, your trousers into your boots because <laughs> it'll funnel the, the cow poo down. Yeah, you learn about getting up at three in the morning to go do some horrendous task like falling or something and um you learn that it's you really don't want to be there and it's highly stressful but then on the way back you stop the car beside the road and the sun's coming up and you look out the countryside and you go well this isn't bad is it so yeah. it was a real life of peaks and troughs but ultimately for me it began to be more about production uh livestock production than being the kind of I suppose the caring vet in my head that I wanted to be. You find yourself going to uh, sheds of calves that were coughing, and the farmer saying, "Look, I, 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 it's not worth spending money on on a half decent antibiotic. I'm just going to let these ones go," you know. And and that, that sort of stuff. I whatever. After after three years of that, I'd, I, that was that was enough for me. And after a big, a lovely gap time of backpacking for a year and a half for my wife around the world. We, we came back and I went into small animal practice and kind of that was it really. So sure. um, Julie, I'm sure you have a, do you have a similar sort of story to tell about your transition? It, it's all, almost exactly the same, yeah. And I can tell the point at which I fell out of love with mixed practice. I went to went to a farm that I'd been to many, many times. Really like the farm where you would go and have a beer. Yeah, sometimes. Do you remember when pubs were open? And um, I went to, to see one of his cows and a uterine prolapse. I said, right, right, Bill, let's get the uh, get the tarp out, get the lube rail, and go for it. He said, um, how much is it going to cost? So mm -hmm. I looked at the scale of fees, and I forget what it was now, 150, 200, whatever. He said, yeah, no, she's she's only worth 150. Shame, but can't do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I phoned my boss at the time and said, I don't want to, I don't want to sign off the slaughter for her. Can we do a sort of pro bono? He said, look, go on then, 50 quid will cover it. So I thought it was, it was absolutely overjoyed. And we did it, put the uterus back in, absolutely fantastic. And on the way home, I stopped by the side of the road and thought, I, I don't want this. I don't want it to come down to, I can do this. This is great. But no, it's not mm -hmm. worth it. 
Mm. Um, but as you say, you talk about production animals now, and that's fine. The way that the, the, the farm veterinary medicine is, is developing is uh, to, to treat whole herds, whole flocks, um, and less about the individual, yeah. other than to make sure that there is no suffering. Clearly, that, that, that's yeah. the, the, main, the main role. Uh, and you throw in prolapse, well, that's euthanized immediately now, and uh, put into the food chain, or depending on what's, what's done to it. But it wasn't for me. I see, Julian, I think that's the key. And I think that's the, 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 the whole answer to all of our careers is, you know, it, that wasn't you, that wasn't me. For some people, it is them. And yeah. for all of us, it's about finding out what is us. Yeah, and once you yeah. know what yeah. you are, what is you? What is you? That kind of sense. What is you? What is you? Once you know what is you, then you can be you. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're down with it, aren't you? You know what is you, you're down with it. Yeah. So uh, have you found out what is you then, Pete? Well, oh, Janie. Well, right. So <laughs> I I happily, okay, so my story got more, like, got more complicated as time went on because, so I was quite happy then doing my, you know, probably two-thirds clinical small animal, one-third media stuff. And I was I was enjoying that. That was a good <laughs> mix, a great mix, actually. But then, then what happened was it, it got a bit personal now. So... Five, five years ago, what happened was my mother, who'd had Alzheimer's for a decade, she passed away. Four years ago, my father, who was a, a daily smoke piper, he got throat cancer and he passed away. And then and I was I was okay with those things. I rode over those, those waves and it was grand. And then three years ago, what happened was the elderly aunts, if you like, my mother's mm. remaining siblings, they went too. And I've been really close to them. And at that point, if you like, the shelf had been cleared um, of all the older generation. And um, I was now being moved up to the top shelf. And I was kind of looking at the looking at the calendar and going, OK, so in 15 years time, I'm going to be in my 70s in 15 years time. Now, people in their 70s, they don't like run after buses very fast. They don't start new exciting businesses. They hmm. kind of they're on the wind down, really. And so, you know, 15 years, like 20 years is a long time. Uh it kind of you can kid yourself that it's almost like never really gonna happen. Hmm. But 15, 15 years is pretty close. Like I, I remember very clearly what I was doing 15 years ago. So that means that three years ago, I really cottoned on to the fact that I had a limited amount of time left to do anything a bit different. And that had a choice of either carrying on in daily clinical work as I was for the next 10 to 12 years until I stop. And that would be that. And so that th this was a very unsettling feeling for me. Mm. Um, and at, at the same time, and, and this, this was a very real thing, and I remember it so clearly, I started, and it sounds a bit psychotic, but it wasn't schizophrenic or psychotic or anything. It was just a thing that happened that in the middle of a consultation that was a particularly long-winded one where an owner had four brachycephalic dogs all in the consult room for booster vaccinations and annual checks. There were four of them. And each one took about a good 50 minutes. So there was an hour in there with this person and their four dogs. And they were all panting noisily. And the room was getting hotter and hotter. And she was talking to me about all sorts of minutiae of stuff with each dog. And this voice in my ear started, and I could hear it so clearly. It was saying, you don't want to be here. Why are you here? You don't want to do this. You don't want to be in this room doing this stuff. Why are you still doing it? And it, it was really as clear as that. And and I said, you didn't okay. rip your shirt off to reveal a, a lumberjack shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was just about like that. So, and at the same time, um, I guess an opportunity came up for doing something different. Um, and and so it kind of happened together, and and it was it was really a case of it was you know sometimes in life it's not it doesn't feel like you have a choice it feels like mm. you know I, I I honestly I genuinely think that if I if somebody said to me you absolutely need to stay doing pretty much full time clinical work all the time for the next fifteen years 
I think I would probably have been institutionalized. I, I, I'd have been certainly been back to that doctor and mm. said, look, give me those antidepressants now. <laughs> because it just, <laughs> it, it just, just give, give me a 15 year supply. It's <laughs> yes. Yeah. What, what you're describing there, Peter, is, is, is sort of like the ages of man, isn't it? And, and how what is you changes as your experience and your age changes and develops. I mean, that's uh, so let, let me ask you this then, Peter. I mean, I, I want to ask you two quick fire questions. It's like having two therapists. This is wonderful. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to recline a little bit. <laughs> well, well you, you know we're not paying you. But you, you pay us. <laughs> yeah, our bill comes through first. <laughs> I missed that bit. <laughs> so, no, uh, two, two quick fire questions for you. I mean, um, would you change anything? If I did it again, no, I wouldn't, because I've, I've thoroughly in love, I absolutely loved every bit of the journey. Yeah. And that's been the only way it could have been, because when I stop loving it, I can no longer do it because I stop being happy doing it. And if I'm not happy doing it, then I, I I've mentally and then almost physically as a consequence of the mentally, I'm unable to carry on. Okay. So I'm just my 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 constitution is such. I absolutely need to love what I'm doing, otherwise um, just it doesn't work. So. Okay. All right, well, the, the, the next question on that one then is knowing that you're, you're settled and you wouldn't change a thing, which is fantastic. What would you, if you're gonna write a note to your 18 year old self, what would you actually say in that? What advice would you be giving to your 18 year old self now? I, I, I think the simple answer is, is don't worry so much and like be unashamedly yourself. Yeah, I would have worried quite a bit about stuff and about what I'd worry about things maybe not working out. And I'd, I, I might worry about um, how I was presenting to the world, that kind of thing. And as you get older, you realize it, it, the very best you can do is just be genuinely yourself. Although I have heard that's the very worst thing you can say to some people. Mm -hmm be yourself <laughs> <laughs> because some of them will be and that's just not right is it? we've not met before have we <laughs> <laughs> but like for me you no know, for me it is about about being confident enough in yourself that you can just be yourself and not be not be fussed about it and people can take it or leave it you know hmm. it's, it's interesting I, I wanted to drag you away from there and, and, and talk about the the fear aspect because you you said in your uh, in your email to us um, that you you realise life is short, you're going to get one crack of the whip, and you you started doing things that that, that frighten you. Do, do you want to tell us about one one of those because they quite interested me? Well, okay, there's been a few of those, but the, the the two probably the two most significant ones are first of all, I started to do triathlons, and I did those for two reasons. Firstly, because it was a challenge, and I. I didn't know if I could do it. I was afraid of doing it, but then when I did it, I found actually I could do it. But once you prepared, it wasn't so bad. So that was the first thing. And, I, and, and actually as part of that, again, to go back to mental health stuff, I found that daily exercise just gets my head in the right place. And times mm -hmm. when I have been, when that, that old voice in my head has started, <laughs> I found that going for a really good long run helps the voice go away a bit, you know, and mm -hmm. helps you just feel cheerier about things in general. That was the first thing. Probably the most terrifying thing I've done in recent years, though, which I started again, I started doing it three years ago actually, was has been improv. Right. Yeah, yeah. So tell us more about that. When did you get into it? Is the group? Is it? Uh... This is improvisation, isn't it? Improvisation. Yeah, like I knew, I knew nothing about this, and it was actually, uh, it was at a BSAV congress actually for me you know, three years ago. Somebody said to me, "You should try improv," and I, 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 I knew about as much as you just said there, Mike. That I knew that improv meant improvisation, but I didn't really know what it was at all. And so, basically, for people who don't know what improv is, is essentially you go into a room with a group of 10 to 15 other people. Two of you will be chosen usually, and you'll stand up in front of everybody else, just stand here in front of them, and you will start to have a conversation. One person will say something, the other person will say something else, and then you start to have what they call as a scene. And what a scene is, is basically, it's like a, it's kind of like a sketch. You're making up a sketch, like a, a sketch on a television sitcom or something. You're making it up on the spot, the two of you, or maybe the three of you or four of you, in front of everybody else, and they're all just sitting there watching you. And, and at the start of it, 
none of you have the foggiest idea what's going to what it's going to be about. So, so you might sometimes there's different exercises they use. They might you might say to the room, so what's it going to be about? And they, somebody might say, um, there's two of you and you're flying a plane. And you go, okay, it's two. Of, we're going to be two people flying a plane. And then somebody else says, and one of you is stark raving mad, and you don't know at the start of the sketch which one of you it is. And so. <laughs> Two of you are sitting. Hey, Pete, hey, this sounds just like veterinary ramblings. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has been a year of improv. I, I did. Um, it I it did is. That's exactly well. what you do. And so, anyway, that's that's the thing. That's really how it goes, you know. I, I did you I've crash? done a lot of acting in, in my in my long, long life. Uh, so, from the age of, of four or five, my mum put my brother and sister and I into drama classes, and uh, we went on to do our, uh, our lambda qualifications. And I've done, I've done a lot of improv and loved it. It is great fun. Uh, and my Terri- twin do you not sister. Get terrified? I, do you not get terrified? No, not anymore. Not anymore. Um, I think did I? Have, I think I started so young that it was normal for me. Okay. And my my twin sister and I. It's difficult to know whether we've ever had a conversation that hasn't been improv. To be honest. <laughs> and and the the other thing that ha- I, that, that happens a lot in improv, which which is for me the most exhilarating bit is that sometimes you'll be asked to do quite emotional stuff. Right. So, so, so um, another example would be we two of us had to act. We had to be um, a husband and wife who were just at the end of their busy day. So, so I'm then the, the husband working away at home in the kitchen, and the wife comes in. And I'm saying hello, good evening, love. How was your day today? And we'd be talking. And he said, okay, that's it. Now. What I want you to do is we want the cracks in the relationship to appear. And on a scale of 0 to 10, we want you to get very quickly to 10 out of 10 being emotional about the crack in your relationship. And so you then have the same couple again. Mm. This time I say to her, she says, can I have a glass of wine? And I say, another. And again, <laughs> <it> just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and there's something, there's something I can't explain it utterly exhilarating about expressing an emotion such as anger or, or such as or it could be sadness whatever but you, you when you do this thing um your your, your heart you, you actually feel because you're acting emotion i suppose yeah you, you feel emotion as well and you do. It's, it's very draining isn't it very draining very and, and and like i say it's exhilarating and you feel a bit euphoric afterwards i used to get the bus into the classes on the way in i'd just be saying to myself why are you doing this why why are you? I, <laughs> it's just such an awful thing you're going to have to stand up in front of everybody and you're not going to know what you're saying and you're going to be really embarrassed and every week that would happen and the guy would say to us okay guys you're all here all of you feel kind of this is awkward but i need to say to you what's the very worst thing that can happen and we all kind of agree the worst thing that can happen is that you're going to get embarrassed and is being embarrassed that big a deal well not really and so and so it was and then we it, all the classes then led to a, a performance where we we, we went we went we rented a hall and we asked our friends to come along and we did a whole evening of improv in, in front of a bunch of bunch of people really which was again very stressful but also very exhilarating and probably for me one of the very worst things about COVID has been that improv unfortunately has had to stop completely because it's so completely hands-on yeah. in place yeah. and all that stuff yeah have you ever tried improv singing Pro- probably not what you actually describe singing comes into it as in <laughs> like one of my real phobias in life is singing in mm-hmm. public I hate that but one of the things you had to do improv is a ring of people one person gets pushed into the middle they have to start singing a song and they have to keep singing the song until somebody taps them on the back. And then that person has to start singing a song, any song, any song at all. And so it goes on and on until everybody's done it. And so you, you, you're you you're forced to sing in public, which, but everybody, like most people hate that anyway. So fine, what's the big deal? It's embarrassing. But improv singing sounds a bit different. What's that? It's making up a song as you go along. So someone will give you a subject for a song and, and you, you you make it up and you try and find uh, the rhymes for the next couple of lines in your head as you're going. Oh, uh, and the first person to paint themselves in a corner uh, loses. So you don't want to sing a song about umbrellas, for example, because fella. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> about the only thing you can get, isn't it? Oops, <laughs> bit, one drink. Yeah. 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 I, I can imagine I can imagine that standing around everybody standing around, somebody singing a song in the middle. 
and you're thinking, oh, I know what I'll sing. I'll sing, now what's the words to that song? Yeah, 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 I've got it. And then the next person next to you or the person next to you then taps the singer, moves into the circle and sings your song. Yes. And you're the last person <laughs> to go. And oh my God, it was yeah. terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, Julie, um, Mike, that is the, the I think one of the, one of the one of the features of improv that you don't really understand until you do it, which is mm. you, you can't plan it in advance. You can't. So 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 that like because the, the natural thing would be okay, I, we're going to be up on the stage soon. I'm going to do this, but by its very nature, because it's prompted by the other person, um, you can't you can't plan it. It has to absolutely come from the heart yeah. or from the air or from wherever the hell it comes yeah. from. And it yeah, has yeah. to be completely spontaneous, which, which as a, it's, it's kind of like a, it's like an extreme form of creation or, or art, I suppose, in that way. Yeah. And sometimes it's absolutely terrible. Like if you watch improv, <laughs> like I have yeah, to say, some, some you, of it is, I think some of those bad. improv songs must be must have been really awful songs. I'm afraid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. really, really bad. <laughs> really bad. But at the same time, sometimes it is inspired and and really entertaining when it's at its very best. So it's fear. It was it was a challenge. It was a personal challenge then, Pete, and fear that got you into improv. It was, it was, yeah. Okay. I think, I think it was, it was, yes, it was, that, that's exactly, I, I, I don't know where it comes from, but I ha have a need sometimes to do stuff that I'm afraid of. Yeah. So you, then, you mentioned, you mentioned. Then, I discover actually you can do stuff you're afraid of and it's, not as bad as you think it's going to be. So you, you mentioned earlier on that there were, there were two things that you were quite fearful of and that got you into new directions. One was improv. Now, I, I want just want to explore, was it the joy of getting dressed up in skin-tight rubber suits and lycra <laughs> that got you into triathlon? Was it the fear of that or was it was the love of that and the fear of the performance? It's complicated as the best way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> well it can't be that complicated because i've seen a youtube video of you dressed in a rubber suit running bare feet across a a, a rocky shore and it was called a day in the life of a vet i think but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's okay it's only been seen by 200 people uh, you, you've just been you've just been snorkeling with sharks i believe at the oh yes 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 yeah well that was do you know what that was that was what's called a show reel right so do you remember about, again, I think it was about three years ago, it could be four years ago now, the BBC put out into veterinary media that they were looking for vets to do a, a new television show. Mm. And, and, they, and they, they basically asked everybody to send in short video um, show reels of, you know, introduce yourself through a video. And so I, I put that together as a way of ah, right. auditioning. It was an audition for this program. Mm. But so th this whole telly thing and digital communication thing, now you're involved in a, in a project called, is it Pet Fix? It's called Pet Fix, yes. Pet Fix. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about Pet Fix, right. where, where it so, came from, what it is? Yeah, so this started, it was the three years ago. It was the time when um, I suppose I started doing the. It was my midlife, one of my one of my many midlife crises. When <laughs> is that like, <laughs> like the rubber gear and the triathlon and, and yeah, that. yeah, yeah. When all the elderly aunts had died, and I realised I only had a smaller number of years left to do anything, um, a bunch of things happened together. First of all, I I've, I've written a few books, and somebody had asked me to, to 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 put together a book idea, and I'd written this book idea, which was kind of. Um, do I need to go to the vet or not? So basically it was a book of veterinary triage. And I, I'd written this, written this book concept. And then that was just sitting there and I was going to go, well, wh where do we go with this? And then somebody I know really well approached me and said, look, I have a friend who is uh, an investor who'd like to um, look at um, um, using the internet to get animal information to pet owners and see how we can make a thing of that because we reckon the internet is definitely where it's all going mm -hmm. and um and I, I thought to myself well you know we could use the base a book's a bit unwieldy if somebody's having a little bit of a, uh, an issue with a pet so it'd be much better if you could put the book information onto on, onto a sort of a computer interactive um some sort of uh 
some sort of website and app. So we put it all together and came up with this idea of, of pet fix. So pet fix is, is, is more about telehealth. So we, we've taken the idea, the principle is this, that as it's kind of, you talked about evolution of your career or whatever, one thing leading to another. So essentially it's an extension of what I've done as a vest in the media. And as a vest in the media, I've been giving out information about, about pets and pet care. I've been answering readers' questions in newspaper for years. I've been going on the radio and listening to, to people tell me what's wrong with their pets and giving them some advice. So it's kind of like that put onto the internet. Mm-hmm. So um, different aspects of it would be that it would be a, there's a, an automated triage system. So you, you know, you what's wrong, what bit of your pet's wrong, click here, then click here, then click here, then click here. And at the end of it, after asking all these questions, um, it'll say, you need to go to the vet immediately because your dog's just eaten six Easter eggs. Or it could be, um, you know, you just need to watch your pet carefully over the next couple of days. And if things don't change, you absolutely need to go to the vet then. Or whatever, triage, telling them, giving them guidance as to roughly what they should do. And that you can automate that to some extent in the same way as you can automate, um, you know, simple question answers on any topic on the internet. Um, there's lots, you know, whether it's a, a computer issue or whatever, or your own health, you can do these things automated. At the end of it, then, there's what's called an Ask a Vet tool. So you can click on a button and you can send a question to the vet along with some photographs or whatever. And, and the vet, who's me actually, will then um, get back to you, usually within the hour, with, and you have to be like, careful what I do here, because I'm not actually allowed to, to give personalized advice. Hmm. You're not allowed to do that um, under under Veterinary Council of Ireland regulations. You can yeah. give general advice only. So you have to be quite careful. Not, but 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 at the end of the day, what I'm saying to people, is I'm giving people guidance. And I, I'm, I'd happily share the sort of questions I get asked and the answers I give to anybody because it's, it's not, I'm not, my, my sense very much is I'm not taking the place of that at all. I'm supplementing that. So, um, so sort of question, I get quite a lot of behavioral questions, simple things like one of my dogs is bullying the other dog, you know, it's snapping at it all the time. What do I do? That kind of stuff. Um, behavioral stuff. You might get questions about like somebody, somebody today sent me a picture of a, of their, of their dog, which has a, has a, a lump, lump on its neck. It's, it's quite a big lump. And the obvious thing that they need to do is they need to go <laughs> to the vet to get it checked out. But what I can do through pet fix is I can show them a video where it shows them, look, this is this is what happens with lumps. You have to make a diagnosis of what the lump is. Generally, vets will do a fine needle aspirate. That means you do this and you put, uh, make a smear. It goes to the lab. They look at the cells to make a diagnosis. Now, what you need to do with your dog is go to the vet and and that's probably the sort of thing that will happen. So that's so it's basically what what how I see it is essentially I'm like a guide, like a, an informed guide for owners because I know that if you go to Google and put in blah about your pet, you'll probably find it quite difficult to make sense of what you what you read. I'll give you two examples of this because I think it's really really relevant to, to the vet profession actually. Mm-hmm. If you Google cruciate disease or ruptured cruciate in dogs, what comes up the top? for sure, is you get taken to websites and other generally surgical websites who have, where, where, where the people who have the websites have clearly done a really good job of search engine optimizing their content. So mm-hmm. the searches for cruciate ligament rupture, they come up near the top. And it, what they do is really excellent. But the only problem is this, is that it's, I think it's quite difficult for people to get advice such as, if your dog weighs less than 15 kilograms, there's an argument you may not need to have surgery on that dog. And that if you don't do anything, your dog may well get better after two or three months. It may not. Yeah. And, you know, you should discuss surgery with the vet. But it, it's that, difficult to get unbiased information about anything. It, it is. You're absolutely right. Or, or, if, or if you Google cannabis oil and dogs, you'll only get good stuff. You won't have anybody say, you know, good stuff as in biased marketing selling stuff. Mm. Mm. You're not going to. So the idea of Petfix is that people can get trustworthy, unbiased information, which is as close as possible to what uh, contemporary science says you should do without yeah. any yeah. vested interest telling you anything else. So that's in, in that's, other words, they're getting an evidence based answer. That's that's the aim of the thing. Yeah. 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 Now, it's more complex than that because we also have a um, we've got a, a, a shop there. Uh, 
a, a pet the pet fix shop where I think this goes back to the four year old in me that wanted to have a pet shop. <laughs> so, so basically, I, 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 you know yourself as a vet, you come across all sorts of stuff that's really good for pets, like chuck it balls or like some items I've got here for my. I've got my CPG coming up. My six seconds, you said, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to show those items during my sixty seconds of CPG. But um, so lots of stuff that I know is really great for pets, which we have in our pet, our, our shop there. And what we also have is we've got something called a um, pet personalization tool, which is, again, I love how computers can do this. You get the computer asks you all these questions like, how often do you walk your dog? How old is it? What, what breed is it? Has it been neutered? What sort of parasite control do you do? Does your cat hunt? Is it indoors, outdoors? Um, uh, where's your dog sleep or ask you all these questions at the end of it then the system churns you out a page on the computer which has graded different aspects of your dog life as in green means you're doing everything right amber means you can make a few improvements and red means your dog hasn't had any vaccination for five years you absolutely need to get the fucking vaccination done so mm -hmm. so the idea is that people can look quickly at, at a report and see those are the areas in my pet's life which are red and which you need to take action on and so those are the so it's it's the website look it's taken us nearly three years to build the thing and so it's it's it's, it's really a quite... nice website I had a look I had a little drive of it today it's uh, uh, it looks nice and also there are obviously bits that you can only access if you become a a, a member well you see but there yeah. are other things that you can access uh, without becoming a member our model is the subscription model which is people pay. Um, seven euros a month or so about six quid a month and for that they can ask us they can um, they can get two things first of all they can ask as many questions as they want to the vet um, they and they can access a whole library of of videos about different things and articles and that stuff but thirdly if they go to this pet store they get a discount off everything so if they buy most of their pet stuff from us which we hope they will do like everybody needs to buy pet food and all sort of Mm. pieces then they will by being a member they'll get enough of a discount that it pays it pays it makes it worth their while to spend the seven euros a month so that's kind of that's really it in a nutshell mm. that's cool it's interesting and i i i've just been looking at in fact earlier at the at the store um you you do a lot uh a lot of things for reptiles as well and i guess the, the idea there is uh, anything that's on there members of the public can trust that actually that this isn't just a, a useless um turtle supplement. food that's, that's a flake yeah. that doesn't have everything you need that's the idea um julian and uh, i you know it's so i i i try to screen everything that we have up um i have to say there's a lot of things in a shop and sometimes it's difficult to I'm, I'm always two things that we have there are well feedback is really important that's one of the great things about a website compared to uh, mm. like a book or whatever in that you do make mistakes sometimes and with a website you can correct them instantly mm -hmm. so you know if if okay like if if we have products that 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 sometimes somebody might not feel is right then we can take them away if we have don't have products that people really want we're able to say to them look we don't actually stock that, but it looks really cool. So give us a couple of weeks and we'll get it for you. And that's one of the things that's really exciting about it. But the idea mm -hmm. is, yes, that everything you buy there, you can trust and that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good value. Okay. Yeah. What I'll continue was, a little. I, I had a look at it and I, I, as well, and I felt that the, the overriding feel of the thing was not so much how do I fix my ill pet, but how do I keep my pet healthy in the first well, place? That's why I think telehealth is probably a better term to use than telemedicine. Yeah. I have to say, I, I feel quite self-conscious about this in, in the veterinary arenas, even like talking to you guys, because th th there's some very, very loud and quite angry voices speaking out about telemedicine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think with some justification, because I, I think that the, 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 cons the legitimate concern is that um, if people can do um casual and superficial evaluations over a video um you know it, it just isn't possible to do the same sort of in-depth yeah. discussion i mean there's so many examples at the same time there's 
you know, that there's some things that you you can do very well by telemedicine or by from a distance. Like I tell you one story that came in, one one ask a vet question that came in to me it was a really good example of that. So this person had a cat that, that wasn't eating, right? Okay. I mean, you can't tell much from that. So I asked them a few questions, and the cat wasn't eating, and it was just it was it was sitting in the corner of the room where it didn't normally sit, and it was making um, an unusual vocalization. So I think you guys probably know what that probably was. And so yeah. I was able to say from that, I, I said, I, I said, well, is he passing urine or feces? I don't know. Um, but he's not eating at all. He's just sitting in the corner of the room and he's making a, a really strange wailing noise. I said to her, look, you really need to get that to bed absolutely immediately. Don't don't wait till tomorrow morning. Don't even wait until this evening. You yeah. need to go to the vet absolutely right now. And so she took the cat to the vet and it was indeed a blocked cat. And, you know, I couldn't make that diagnosis, but I think as an experienced vet, you can, you do learn to, mm. to spot the signs of, 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 of big crises, really, don't you? Yeah, and I think you made the important distinction earlier about um, triage being the essential part of, of, a, uh, of a telemedicine consult. Uh, what, what is important? Because clients don't often know. Uh, they... As as you said earlier, they they don't know what they don't know, and so for this person with her cat and had a blocked bladder, it's obvious to us as vets uh, that 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 was the likeliest thing. But for the owner, it could have just been a worry that her cat was spooked, something that worried it, it was vocalising yeah, because it was upset. Yeah. So uh, if if you've not been there, then the danger is that she would have uh, done nothing until the next day. Thought, well, if if he's still like this tomorrow, I'll, I'll, I'll take him to the vet, or I'll, I'll phone the vet and ask. So this provides another level of care. And it's not taking work from vets, which is, is often uh, the, 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 the levelling complaint, isn't it? Uh, well, yes, I tell you, one of, one of the advertising things that we use is... Um, save on unnecessary visits to the vet or unnecessary expensive visits to the vet. Now, I didn't make up that slogan. I'm not particularly proud of it, but vets don't like that at all. And um, But I would then say to them, well, are you saying that people should make unnecessary visits? To absolutely. That, that's the word, isn't it? Unnecessary. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because, absolutely. Necessary yeah. is necessary. And I, yeah. in my mind, what, how we help is two ways. First of all, yes, some people, okay, my dog's vomited once. It's right as the bottom um in great form but he brought up his breakfast well, no you don't need to go down to your vet you know you don't just mm. hold off you know don't feed your dog to the supper and give it something bland in the evening and fine you yeah. know so, so they will save on unnecessary visit to the vet absolutely um, and no, no vet likes that sort of visit where as soon as he walks through the door you think well actually this, this is fine but they've come in through the door i've got to charge them a consult fee and that sits very awkwardly on, on most vets' shoulders. So actually okay. having that weeded out. That's, that's the thing. And then the, but the second thing, which is just as important, is that there's ones like that blocked cat where you mm. people don't realise they need to get their pet to the vet really quickly um, or, 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 or their, their pet's going to be in serious trouble. So and, and that will help vets. If vets are worried about their business, yes, they may lose some of the unnecessary visits to the vet. They may, yes, I accept. Um, but as you say, a lot of vets don't particularly mind that because those are the ones which are are just they're, they're not what being a vet is really all about. No, absolutely. Um, uh, um, but but for those ones, they also gain some where where animals have to go to the vet and, and they own a silver Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, I, that's I think that's I think the, you've got to embrace it because telemedicine is here to stay. There's no doubt about that. Uh, yeah, in some form or another. And I think as vets, we we, we need. Not to resent it, but to, to embrace it. Just just wonder, Pete. Where, yeah. What are you going to do for your next midlife crisis? Where, where to? <laughs> what, what's the next project? I I, I know what, what it is, um, and it, and it's 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 a very nice one, and it's called retirement. <laughs> <laughs> you can have time for that. Yeah, not for a while anyway. Not yeah. for a while. Listen, can I give you my 60, 60 seconds of yeah. CPD? Oh, 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 hang on a minute. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. You're, you're Mike's going to get the timer. First guest. 
that we've ever had that said, can I do my 60 seconds of CPD, please? I prepared this. You've they normally say, I was hoping you'd forget about it. <laughs> Hang on, let me, let me get everything set up. It's just so cool. It's really cool. Excellent. Excellent. What, and and yours is a show and tell as well. I don't think we've ever had any props, have we, for... Uh, Oh. 60 seconds CPD. I, I, I've learned from television that props are unnecessary because they take the camera away from you, they take attention away from you. People concentrate on the prop instead of you, and I quite like that. All right, I'm good to so go. What, what, what do you want to do your 60 seconds CPD on, Pete? What's, what am I going to hmm? do? Do I'm doing my CPD on using technology to monitor your pet's daily habits. Oh. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So then, 60 second CPD challenge, Pete Wedderburn using technology to monitor your pet's daily habits starting now what well, now go what well, hang on push on the side <laughs> there you go that's technology for you pete go there you go. So, the, 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 so these are both items made by sure sure pet care first one is a feeder an automated feeder and what happens is, is closed and what happens your pet comes up the, the machine reads their microchip number and then opens for them. And what that does is that allows you to record how much each of your pets is eating every day. And if you've got an animal that's on special food, like a renal diet, you can exclude other animals from eating it because it will only open for their microchip number. The second item which ties in with that is the Sure the water, water drinker. What this does is this, this Again, any animal can drink from it, but it reads their microchip number and it sends a notification of how much each pet has drunk. So on my mobile phone, I've got all, all four of my pets and every day it tells me how much each one eats and how much each one drinks. So it can identify any changes in their daily habits. Fantastic. Wow. That is, that's fantastic. Actually, Look, do you know, I, I didn't know those things existed, Pete. I really fantastic, didn't. isn't it? Aren't they, this, it's a game changer. It is, people though. who are trying to, to diet cats when they're in a, a multiple cat household, people who are trying to monitor cats with renal failure or, or, or uh, liver disease, diabetes, anything really. Um, yeah, well, wow. Well. This, this embracing of technology. What, what was that local pub of yours, Pete? The Harbour? The, the Harbour Bar. The Harbour Bar. Okay, so how are you going to feel when you walk in with your COVID vaccination certificate and it scans the certificate, <laughs> and it tells me how many Guinnesses you've had to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's that's not a good that's not good use of technology at all. How are you going to no. like it? Hey? No, no. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, we'll avoid that. Oh, we will. I am looking forward to that day. A pint of Guinness. You know how in iron where they pour the Guinness, oh. and and oh. and the head comes up over the top of the pint like that. You know, and when you drink it, there's you get this Guinness moustache on your upper lip and it's completely smooth. There's no sense of the bitterness that some exported Guinness has about mm -hmm. it. It's just like drinking amber, That's amber it's nectar. It's, it's, it's what I, I love Guinness. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, I have to say, I think, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. And for, for anybody who hasn't experienced drinking a Guinness in an Irish bar, if there's one thing you've got to put on your bucket list, it's drinking a Guinness or two or ten in a fridge. You can never have, you've got to have the other one. Yeah, you've got, you've to, have, got to have the other one. What, what I particularly like is where they stack them up on the bar. <laughs> yes. They do that at the harbour. Well, where the harbour <laughs> started pouring <laughs> ten pints and they're all settling gradually and you'll gradually top them up and top yep. them up and top them up. And when you've got about a third left, you give them a nod and yours is stepping on that rack. Yes, and, and the that's, experienced that's, farmer will put a little shamrock uh, pattern yeah. in the top. No, they only do that for tourists, purely. <laughs> um, there's a, a drink which you might be aware of called a baby Guinness. Do you know the baby Guinness? No. No. So no. Baby Guinness, and I can't remember what's in it. I think it's like Tia Maria with Baileys on top of it. But whatever it is, it comes in like a shot type glass. Right. And mm -hmm. it looks like a little glass of Guinness. It's got the black and then the white on top. And... Uh, it's when you get onto the baby Guinnesses that you know you're in real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you want to hear a joke? Go on then. Yeah. Good joke. So just to give you a bit of a uh, bit of a preamble. Hang on a minute. Wait a minute. Have you please mm -hmm. given us 60 second CPD tonight? Oh, oh yes, I'm getting things in order, aren't I? Yeah. We we need a CPD certificate for that, don't we? Then I'll let you tell oh. you your joke. 
Here we go. Right, I've got here a CPD go. certificate. That's fantastic. Is that it's real? Yeah. Is that registered with uh, such and such and such and such? D definitely, definitely. Oh, yeah. 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 We'll, 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 we'll do that in a minute. Yeah. Just pass it to the screen there, please. So it says, it says Thank certificate you. of a great evening. Thank you. Lovely. This uh, this certifies that the evening has been really great, and we've learned stuff too. What a great <laughs> evening! <laughs> and um, uh, nice. what have I got on here? So I've, I've got me doing kind of a triathlon mm -hmm. there. Uh, yeah. That certainly is a bit of a triathlon. This was the constant challenge a few years back. So we just done our uh, five mile canoe round uh, round Coniston, this and just about to start off on the cycle ride. Good man. Um, what have we got? Over, over this side. Oh, there we go. There's a, there's a Herdwick sheep. All right. For no real reason. I just, yeah. I quite liked it. It's very uh, pretty. And there, and there's a bumblebee. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And, uh, and there's a duck. And somehow I was hoping to get the conversation around to ducks, but we never quite made it. Ah. Um, I like ducks. I have to say, I'm a. Well, there we go. Ducks. It's, we we have yeah. ducks. I. Uh, uh, I, I, I was holding a duck today, funnily enough. We've got Indian runner ducks. Do you know what Indian runners are? I yeah. do, I do, yeah. Yeah, I used to have some. Did you? They're, yeah. Aren't they, aren't they lovely? Fantastic, fantastic. They're not, they're not very friendly. They're not, no, not they're kind of, all eyes worked. They, they don't really like being held, in fact. I had to hold it for a photograph. And she was lovely when she was being held. She, she, she sat there and looked very duck-like. Mm. Very regal, really. But, uh, They're very svelte, aren't they? Very svelte ducks. Yes. Yeah. So um, anyway. And then yeah. she bit yeah. <laughs> One of the worst experiences I had in television was with a swan, because I had a swan on my lap. Because that's what you do on television. You go into the breakfast house and you go and you sit on the couch. So I sat on the couch and I had this big swan on my lap. And I was talking mm -hmm. about swans, whatever about swans. Anyway, halfway through the conversation, I became aware that this swan obviously had lice because I could feel lice crawling down. My oh, oh, I could oh, feel yeah. them crawling down through my shirt, down my bare back, and it was horrendous. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wonderful. Go on then, Julian. Let's yeah. let, let him tell a joke, please. Keep some up. Oh, yeah. But this this is about uh, it's quite a sad story actually about this um, guy walking through the streets of Paris. Thinking, I'll, I'll go somewhere, get a get a morning coffee, and uh, he sits down at this cafe, and he's just about to tuck into his espresso when he hears this. <laughs> and he turns around. There's, there's this elderly gentleman sitting behind him, crying his eyes out. He thinks, I can't let this poor chap cry without making some attempt to to, to find out what's going on and cheer him up if I can. So he, he says. So, Excuse me, sir? sir. Yes, yes. I, I hate to see anyone looking as upset as you are. Well, can I ask, well, is there a problem? Can I help? He says, no, I don't think anyone can. So, gosh, that's a dreadful thing to say. Um, are you are you in financial problems? Can I ask? Is it, you know, whenever I'm depressed, it's usually money. He says, no, no, I, I'm a millionaire. So are you? Yes, yes. I, Multi-millionaire, I have, I have a wonderful, wonderful chateau, and I've just married a twenty-eight-year-old model. She's gorgeous, beautiful, and here's me, eighty-eight. Oh, she wakes me every morning with a with a kiss, and we make love, and then I, and then I wander out and have a coffee and go home and. And she's she's prepared lunch for me, and, and we have a three course lunch and a glass of champagne, and we may make love again. And I'll I'll lay in her arms all afternoon, and I have the most wonderful, wonderful life. He said, "Well, what what's wrong then?" He said, "I, I can't remember where I live." <laughs> <laughs> That is one of your best jokes, actually. Hey, there you go. I got one. I got one. Um, I got one. Really, I, I, earlier on, I was in the kitchen with Trudy, and she was cutting up onions, and she thinks she's really clever. She says, she says, onions are the only food that makes her cry. 
So I chucked a coconut at her. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Ah, 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 ah. Absolutely. That's one thing that's come come out of lockdown. Actually, um, there's some funny stuff on YouTube. <laughs> sure it is. Yeah, and of course we're on YouTube. We are indeed on YouTube. This will be we on, are. of course. It is. Uh, I saw. I did have a wee look at some of the other ones. Did you really? I did, of course. And you still agreed to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah, of course. Thank yeah, goodness it is. For editing. It goes out on YouTube. It goes mm-hmm. out on Facebook, or you can download the uh, the audio file from Spotify, iTunes, and various other um, platforms. They're called, aren't they, Pete? You're, you're more into this music uh, than uh, we are. Yeah, I think so. Wherever you get your podcast from is what people usually say. Wherever you get your podcast from, That's don't it. forget. Yeah. You've enjoyed <laughs> what you've heard, and uh, you like what you've seen. Click like, share, join us on Patreon, and all those other things, subscribe and get in touch with us. You want us to cover any subject in particular, then let us know and we'll do our best to get that in. So uh, that's it. Pete Wedderburn, Pete the Vet. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much. Thank you you so much. much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the couch tonight. Brilliant. It's fun talking to you. No, it's, it's been really good. So Pete the Vet, thank you very much indeed. And... May your dog go with you. May your dog go with you. <laughs> Good night. Cheers. Good night. Have you enjoyed yourself? There we go. There we go. That was great. Was all right. You yeah. made it really easy. I hope it wasn't t- too rambling. I was a bit aware of sometimes talking too much and stuff like that. Not a problem at no, all. No, it's, it's, ram- it's a bit rambling. So there's That's no... It's all about. That's what it's all about. And as long as you've enjoyed yourself... And yeah, that's, that's one of the main things. Um, I mean, and I, I think people do enjoy just listening to people rambling, really, don't they? Sometimes, yeah. like, great to meet you again, Pete. And good to, to meet you too, guys. Well, yeah, take I, care. I look forward to actually meeting you one day, Pete. Yeah, the Harbour Bar, the Harbour Bar, Harbour Bar, or oh, the, the, the Guinness Bar in Manchester next year. <laughs> yes, indeed, that's probably a date, I'd say. Yeah, that'd brilliant. be brilliant. Good Let's stuff. That'd be great, guys. You take care, Pete. Good Thank night. Thank you very much. Take you care. Care. Take care. Thanks a lot. Night. Night.